Welcome again to our service. Let's begin by praying together the Collect for Purity. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's say together, Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. My dear brothers and sisters, the scriptures teach us to acknowledge our many sins and offenses, not concealing them from our Heavenly Father, but confessing them with humble and obedient hearts that we may obtain forgiveness by His infinite goodness and mercy. We ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before Almighty God, but especially when we come together in His presence to give thanks for the great benefits we've received at His hands, to declare His most worthy praise, to hear His holy word, and to ask for the, ourselves and on behalf of others those things which are necessary for our life and our salvation. Therefore, draw near with me to the throne of heavenly grace. We pray for the forgiveness of our sins. Let's pray. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy hath promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's reaffirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's listen to the Word of God. One of my favorite disciples is Peter. When we're first introduced to him in the Gospels, he, he often comes across as someone who doesn't always get it right. Peter has to be corrected at times by Jesus because he's often thinking the opposite way that Jesus would want him to. He is very human, similar to you and me. However, once Peter catches the vision, 
once he's experienced the power of the risen Lord Jesus and is filled with the Holy Spirit, he changes dramatically. He passionately wants believers to know the reality of Jesus that he had experienced firsthand. So I can imagine him writing this short letter to us to encourage us as we think about the gospel reading about the transfiguration. So imagine this. My dear friends at St. Hilda's Church, we were there. We saw it with our own eyes. Jesus dazzling with light from God the Father. As the voice of majestic glory spoke, this is my son, marked by my love, focus of all my delight. We were there on the holy mountain with him. We heard the voice out of heaven with our very own ears. We couldn't be more sure of what we saw and heard. God's glory, God's voice. The prophetic word was confirmed to us. You do well to keep focusing on it. Listen to Jesus. Your friend, Peter, alias The Rock. Now, how about we pray, and then we'll look at the incident that left such a huge impression on Peter. Let's pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations in all of our hearts be truly acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. So we're looking at Luke chapter 9. All the gospel writers follow the story of the transfiguration with the story of a boy who is desperately suffering and sick, so sick that the disciples are unable to help him. And it's like the two stories are meant to be together as a snapshot of life. Dramatic mountaintop experiences on one hand, followed by valley lows. And it seems that the more that we're open to God, seeking his glory, the more we're also open to the pain and to the suffering of the world around us. Many of us can attest to returning after a, a glorious worship service or some kind of conference. It's so wonderful. You're riding on this high, and almost the very next day, you return to earth with a bump and sometimes a crash. These glorious experiences are not given for their own sake but so that we are better equipped by them. And I think we can look at the story of the transfiguration in a way where the disciples and even us here today can be better equipped to face the difficulties of life. So, Luke chapter 9, verse 28. Now, about eight days after these things, he took with him Peter and John and James and went up into the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered and his clothing became dazzling white. And note in the context of prayer, something dramatic happens. Jesus is transformed. His clothes, his appearance become dazzling white. You know that mountains seem to be the places of encounters with God in the Bible. Remember back with Moses, and he had his mountaintop experience, as it were, in Exodus chapter 33, the burning bush, and his calling to lead God's people out of slavery to freedom. How about the prophet Elijah? 1 Kings chapter 19, it says this, Go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. 
after the wind there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. Where is he? He's in a whisper. And speaking of Elijah and Moses, verse, verses 30 and 31, And behold, two men were talking with him, Jesus, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now, the glory of God is a major theme in many parts of the Old Testament. And I'll give you a thumbnail sketch, as it were. Exodus chapter 13, we find a careful description of the glory of God. The Israelites the Israelites escaped from Egypt and camped at Etham on the edge of the wilderness. The Lord went ahead of them. He guided them during the day with a pillar of cloud, and he provided light at night with a pillar of fire. This allowed them to travel by day or by night. And the Lord did not remove the pillar of cloud or the pillar of fire from its place in front of the people. It is, in fact, the glory of God. Then, one of my favorite passages in the Old Testament, Moses has a face-to-face -face encounter with God. Exodus chapter 33 is the description. Moses says, show me your glory. And it's so intense, it changes Moses. And he says, if you don't go with us, don't go don't let us go any further. The aftermath of the glory. For 40 days, he's actually smitten. And he eats and he drinks nothing. He then receives the law and the Ten Commandments. And when he finally comes down the mountain, his face is literally glowing. Then later, the people of God build a place for God's glory to dwell if that could be done, a tabernacle is described in extraordinary detail in the Bible where a cloud covers the tabernacle. It is the glory of the Lord. And it is so intense, the priests and those ministering there cannot even stand up. However, years passed and the temple duties performed by the priests, well, they become old, as it were, unfortunately. And that's what happens often. It becomes too routine. Go through the religious uh, motions. Slowly, over time, you notice that people drift away from God. But along comes Solomon, and the temple is built in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 1. It says this, When Solomon finished praying, fire flashed down from heaven and burned up the burnt offerings and sacrifices and the glorious presence of the Lord filled the temple. The priests could not enter the temple of the Lord because the glorious presence of the Lord filled it. When all the people of Israel saw the fire coming down and the glorious presence of the Lord filling the temple, they fell face down on the ground, worshipped and praised the Lord, saying, He is good. His faithful love endures forever. What is the glory? The very presence of God with them. But again, sadly, God's people abuse the temple, and it is sad because God's glory and presence slowly wanes over time. And it gets so bad that in Ezekiel chapter 8, we find the temp temple elders, all 70 of them, are offering, offering glory to idols. A pathetic end is coming. The Lord's presence leaves the temple. The God of glory Departing from his people is extremely depressing, to say the least. And for about 600 years, the glory is gone. That's a quick Old Testament sketch of the glory of God. 
And then, all of a sudden, we find Joseph holding his firstborn son on that first Christmas day. And all of a sudden, angels arrive. And what? The glory is back. It pours out, as it were, at the birth of Jesus. Glory to God in the highest and peace to whom his favor rests. After a very long wait, the glory appears in Jesus. Back to our story. We could say that Moses is the establishment of Israel's religion and Elijah preached the restoration of it. Luke tells us in the passage that they are talking about his exodus. Moses and Elijah speaking with Jesus. And it's not a chance use of that word. Exodus could mean departure or going away. It can also mean another way of saying that someone is going to die. But I think because of the connection with Moses, this is pointing ahead to the death of Jesus, which will enact an event just like the great exodus from Egypt in the past. In the first exodus, Moses led the Israelites out of slavery to the promised land. In the new exodus, as it were, Jesus will lead all of God's people out of the slavery of sin and death and bring them home to the promised land, the new creation where everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, forgiven, given hope, and in the future, a resurrection body, new creation. Perhaps we can say that in some ways, Jesus himself is going through a mountaintop experience. He is speaking to Moses and Elijah about his own exodus, his death on the cross. He is talking to two Old Testament greats, long, long gone, long dead. But, of course, they are now speaking with Jesus. While all of this is going on, however, Peter and the others have fallen asleep. And just a quick question, you know the answer to this one. Where else do we find the disciples falling asleep during critical times? Verse 33, And as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. Peter, you can always depend on Peter to say something when conversation is probably not appropriate. My friend used to say, I only open my mouth to change feet. The fact that all the Gospels mention this rather awkward moment is another proof of its authenticity. Peter is trying to take care of a spiritual situation in a worldly way. Peter doesn't quite understand. So Jesus doesn't answer. But an answer is coming. Verse 34, and a cloud comes. It reminds us of what? The glory of God, of course. God's presence. This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. At Jesus' baptism, remember, we hear almost the same thing. Listen to him. Now, we can't really blame Peter and the others for not really understanding the transfiguration and saying the wrong things. I know for sure if I was there, I would want to preserve, as it were, the moment and keep Moses and Elijah and Jesus around forever. But of course, things don't work out like that. 
the disciples were unable to understand how it was that the glory which they had just glimpsed and witnessed on the mountain firsthand, the glory of God the Father's chosen Son, shining like the Son, who is carrying in himself the truth of the laws of God, the promise of redemption, would soon be unveiled on a very different mountain or hill. The hill of crucifixion outside of Jerusalem. It is easy for us as well to not understand because simply we often do not listen to the Lord in his word. Listen to him. This is a far greater authority than Moses and Elijah. Listen to him. I love this verse from Hebrews chapter 1. Long ago, God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets, like Moses and Elijah. And now in these final days, he has spoken to us through his Son. Jesus is the fulfillment of, Listen to him. Listen to him. We should be aware of the temptation to listen to the many voices that are all around us. When Moses and Elijah are gone, they're left alone with Jesus. Everything, of course, points to Jesus. In the Gospel according to St. Matthew and his account, Count of our story of the transfiguration, there's an interesting addition. It says this, Then Jesus came over and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. And when they looked up, Moses and Elijah were gone, and they saw only Jesus. We too often find it difficult to and bewildering at times to know how to understand all that the Lord is doing and saying. In our mountaintop times of joy and in the valley when we're sad. But, of course, the word comes to us, encouraging us to keep on following after Jesus, even when we don't have a clue what is really going on. So it's like we need to hear the word that comes from the cloud of God's glory. This is my chosen son, whom I love. Listen, listen, listen to Jesus. We conclude with the, quote, so what portion of the sermon. So what does this mean for you and for me today. In particular, I'm thinking about the listen to Jesus part and listen to these words on listening from the author Dallas Willard. He writes this, what we see in much of contemporary culture is precisely what Jesus foretold. We have heard Jesus For over 2,000 years, we have heard him. But we've chosen to not do what he said. He warned that this would make us like silly men who built his house on a sand foundation. The rain poured and the building collapsed. Much of evangelical Christianity has preached stoutly against works of righteousness. We are saved by faith alone, we say, which we are. But this leaves us caught in a strange inversion of what of the work of some of the opposition that the apostle Paul faced. You see, they wanted to add obedience to the ritual law for faith in Jesus. We, sadly, on the other hand, want to subtract moral law from faith 
in Christ because we're saved by faith. How to combine faith with obedience Really listening to Jesus is surely the essential task of the church as it moves into the future. I bring us back with our initial letter from our friend Peter, who wrote to us and said, We heard the voice out of heaven with our very own ears. We couldn't be more sure of what we saw and heard. God's glory, God's voice. The prophetic word was confirmed to us. And this line, you do well to keep focusing on it. Listen to Jesus. Listen to Jesus. Listen to Jesus. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the word of God and the word made flesh the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, as we move into the season of Lent this year, may our hearts, our minds, and our spiritual ears be attentive to the Word of God in Jesus Christ. And we pray in his precious name. Amen. Let's continue our service in the words of the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. In the words of the prayer of thanksgiving, let's pray. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all of your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all, for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Well, God bless you and have a wonderful week.